Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is the Internet of Things. So as I suggested at the end of the last video when we were talking about mesh, edge, and fog computing, more and more devices that are not thought of as traditional computing devices are being put onto the internet. And this network of non-traditional computing devices is sometimes referred to as the Internet of Things. And so let's take a quick look at some examples of devices that fit onto the Internet of Things so you have a better sense of exactly what I'm talking about. I think as a consumer, probably the most likely place that you are to run into these sorts of devices are uh, in the concept of a smart home. So if you've got a smart light bulb, for example, um, that would be considered Internet of Things. Why would you want a smart light bulb? Well, if you have smart light bulbs, you can control um, their colors. So, you know, if you've ever shopped for light bulbs, there's the, do you want the bright white? Do you want the soft white? Do you want the warm white? Well, if you've got a smart light bulb, you can just kind of change the rating on the fly. Be like, oh, I have some friends coming over. I want to make it a little bit warmer. Or, you know, I'm trying to do some artwork on the table and I want it to, to have pure white light. So I know exactly what it is I'm drawing. Great. I'll go ahead and crank that up. Um, you can also control the light bulbs for, uh, you know, if, if you're remote uh, and you're you're not there and you want it to make it look like you're there, you can, you know, control those remotely. And so there's a, there's a bunch of potential reasons why you might want to have smart light bulbs as to whether or not it's worth it to have smart light bulbs and what the security risks are. Well, that's kind of up to you. We'll talk about security risks a little bit later in this lecture. Um, you can have sensors uh, connected to the internet. Um, these can be combined with smart speakers, for example. So uh, if you've got a house with smart speakers and sensors, as you move from one room to the next, it can turn the uh, speakers on and off and the music that you're playing can follow you around from one room to another. Um, thermostats can uh, be connected to the internet um, where you can uh, process the data and control it again remotely um, and you know do some analytics on it. So uh, there's a variety of different devices that are being connected to the internet. And I suspect this will this trend will continue uh, and more and more devices will just seem natural. Um, your kids will probably think it's totally normal, whereas I'm still a little weirded out we have smart light bulbs. All right, uh, here's another example of Internet of Things. This is probably one of the best uses I've seen. So when I was in the Stanford dorms as a resident fellow, they actually put the washers and dryers onto the Internet. And so this was actually really handy because it meant that um, usually the washer dryers are all in the basement. They were in the first floor for our building, but uh, you know, if, you, if you're in uh, your room and you want to know whether or not you can do your laundry, you just check the internet page and it's like, hey, dryers one and four are available. So great. You go grab your laundry, you drag it downstairs, you know that there's an available washer there. Um, and it's also pretty handy in terms of seeing when your, uh, when your load's going to be done. So you can uh, check in and say, it'll say, oh, you know, you put your clothes in washer number four and washer number four has 15 minutes left. So um, I thought this was pretty handy. And you can imagine in a big building or a building where there's a lot of uh, use of the washer and dryers and it's kind of hard getting, getting access to them, having this sort of uh, information it actually is quite handy. Um, transportation is another area where we're getting more and more Internet of Things types of capabilities. So just in a car, you know, clearly the navigation system or the entertainment system, you know, that could be part of the internet. And in fact, many of us just use our cell phones for that. So that is part of the internet. Um, there's some discussion on whether the engines and uh, actuators for things like uh, controlling um, how the engine works, uh, whether or not those should be part of the internet of things. I think there are some potential concerns with uh, security in terms of if everything in the car is part of the internet, I think it makes it a little bit easier to hack. Um, you can have the cars communicating with each other. So each of the individual cars could be part of the internet. Um, and this actually could be really useful in terms of, you know, we can get different data sort of like uh, Waze does right now where all the cars are talking to each other. And so they can tell each other what the traffic conditions are. So one of them could say, hey, I was just going across the Bay Bridge 15 minutes ago. You don't want to go that way. It's just a complete nightmare. Go, go a different direction. 
you can embed sensors into the roadways and turn the roadways into smart systems. And then using the internet, they could talk to the cars. Here's another really cool use of uh, the internet. Um, you can have smart parking meters where if you're looking for a space, all the parking meters are part of a network and they all have little sensors telling whether or not they're available. And you can just be like, hey, I need a parking space. Where is the nearest parking space that is currently available? And uh, it'll connect in with your smartphone and you just look on your little map and you go to that parking space. So I think that's really cool. Um, you can also connect it into uh, paying remotely, uh, being reminded, hey, you know, you've only got five more minutes on the meter. <laughs> Do you want to uh, up, 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 put out a little bit more money there and get another uh, half hour or another hour? So I think, I think some of these can be potentially quite useful. Um, so another area where uh, the internet can be used is in industrial processes. And uh, this actually forms a separate area that's sometimes referred to as the industrial internet of things. So we can take a standard industrial process and start instrumenting it by uh, adding different things in that process onto the internet. We can add sensors. Uh, that are on the internet. We can have controllers that uh, can actually be actuated via the network. Um, we can control inventory management using RFID tags. I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, if we've got a fleet of vehicles, we can uh, connect them all to the internet and keep track of those. And I will have to say personally, I'm fond of delivery vehicles, which are on the internet and we can see where they're coming mostly because um, Delivery often has big trouble finding my apartment. And so knowing when they're in the area is actually pretty useful for me. Um, and we can control, we can add security like motion sensors, cameras, and lights onto the internet as well. So these are all um, areas that, you know, they're certainly moving into this area. Uh, and I think, again, we'll see more and more of this. All right, let's go back to this idea of RFIDs. These are radio frequency IDs. Generally, the devices with the RFIDs themselves are not part of the internet, but the devices reading the RFIDs will be part of the internet of things. So an RFID is similar to a barcode. So um, you know, if you've been to the grocery store, and I'm sure you've all been to the grocery store at one point or another, those little barcodes that they use to run uh, at the check st checkout stand to see what the, uh, the particular item that you're purchasing is and what the price of them is, that's the barcode. And so an RFID is very similar to a barcode in that uh, it provides a unique number or a number that's associated with a particular product. But the difference between an RFID and a barcode is that uh, we need to optically scan the barcode, whereas for the RFID, I don't need to optically scan it. Um, I just need uh, that RFID tag to be within a certain distance of my RFID reader. And the actual distance for the RFID reader does vary depending on, there's a bunch of different competing standards, but um, on the low end, you can read the RFID tag from about a meter away. At the high end, you could actually read them as far as 200 meters away. Um, and in a lot of cases, the RFIDs don't actually have their own power. Uh, they're gonna be triggered remotely by um, the device that's, that's scanning the area for them. So uh, one of the most compelling scenarios I've heard for using RFIDs is inventory management. So currently, if you've ever been in a store or you've been part of the staff of a store that's doing inventory, you've got all the employees out and they're running around down each of the aisles, pulling all the items off the shelf and counting them all up. And it's an extremely time-consuming measure. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's annoying and time-consuming. Well, with an RFID on each of the items, you don't need to do that anymore. All you need to do is you need to take an employee with an RFID reader and just walk down each of the aisles of the stores, and the RFID reader will sort of ask each of the boxes on the shelves, hey, what's your ID number, and it'll count them all up, and you'll be done. So uh, inventory counting will go from a huge undertaking to a very simple, quick undertaking. Uh, the main reason why we aren't doing this right now is the RFID prices are still a little bit too high. Um, the low end is around 10 cents per RFID. So, you know, if we were to do this at the grocery store or at, at the drugstore, um, it would add 10 cents to the cost of all the items. And so uh, that's still fairly high. But the first time I gave this lecture, it was actually 15 cents per RFID. So it does seem to be coming down in value. 
And you can imagine once it's down to a couple pennies per item, um, it's probably going to be worth it to switch over. Okay, so there are some concerns that, to note about the Internet of Things. One of them is, you know, how are these devices connecting to the Internet? So most of the devices we use that connect to the Internet either use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Wi-Fi takes a fair amount of energy, um, so that's kind of problematic unless this device is actually plugged in. Um, there is a Bluetooth low energy standard, and so this is the choice for a lot of Internet of Things uh, devices. This also potentially adds a lot more devices to the internet. So you know, if you start counting up how many devices you already have, I'm sure you have a laptop, you've got a cell phone, you might have a tablet, I do. You might have a, a bunch of game consoles, your television might connect to the internet. So that's a fair number of devices. But once we start adding a whole bunch of other devices, like your oven's connecting to the internet, your refrigerator's connecting to the internet, your heaters are connecting to the internet, it starts adding up pretty quickly, and we are already running out of IPv4 numbers, so uh, this would really accelerate the move to IPv6. You'll recall from our discussion on the internet that um, IPv4 uh, uses a set of four numbers between 0 and 255, and that uh, there aren't enough numbers using that standard, so IPv6 is a standard with many, many more combinations. You hear Maddie barking in the background it's because there's a dog outside that's barking and she's, she's all excited about that. Okay, the other concern about Internet of Things, and I, I guess this goes along with Maddie barking there, uh, is that I think there's a lot of security concerns with Internet of Things. And there's a bunch of reasons why uh, you should be particularly careful with the Internet of Things. One issue is that uh, a lot of times the Internet of Things, they're trying to keep the device cost down. So... You know, anytime you're keeping the cost down, uh, that means you're potentially shortchanging security. And so that is a bit of a concern. I think another reason why I, I have concerns about the Internet of Things is a lot of times uh, the cool Internet of Things stuff that comes out, it's some, somebody has a, this idea for, hey, wouldn't it be great if this device was on the Internet? And so they go ahead and, and, and set it up, but they don't actually have any security people. They aren't familiar with security issues on their own, and maybe they don't have the money to hire somebody who's a specialist in security. So, you know, I would say be cautious. Like if you see some random Kickstarter and you're like, that seems like a really cool idea, but it connects the internet, like, do you trust them to have good security? You also need to remember to update your internet of things devices. And this isn't something that a lot of consumers are thinking about. I mean, who thinks about keeping their light bulbs updated all the time? So let's take a look at a couple examples where Internet of Things devices have failed. Um, so smart light bulbs have been hacked. And you might be thinking, well, if somebody takes over my light bulb, what's the worst that can happen? But these are considered potential ways to get around your security. If you can, can hack somebody's light bulb remotely, you are now in their internal home internet. And so that may give them access to things that, uh, and make it easier to access um, things that you don't want them to, whereas if they have to go directly through your router, your router might actually have better security. So one uh, suggestion that I've seen is that you can keep your Internet of Things devices on a guest network. Um, so a lot of Wi-Fi routers have a guest network and then a regular network, and so you could put your Internet of Things devices on your guest network, although that may, uh, that may impact the convenience of accessing them and exactly what you can or can't do with them. Um, Internet of Things cameras have also been found vulnerable to hacking. So, you know, if you've got that camera in your home, think about where you're placing it. Think about what would happen if a hacker were able to, to, to get access to it. Um, I know a lot of security experts who have the cameras on their laptops covered up. Um, one Internet of Things company, Smart Locks, actually bricked when they did an update. Uh, in this case, it breaks such that the locks were always open. It's kind of unclear to me whether that's better or worse than having the locks always locked. But um, yeah, people were not able to lock their homes. Uh, so that's kind of a problem. And I think Internet of Things also provides a lot of privacy concerns. So, well, I think the Internet of Things, there's a lot of cool, interesting, fun stuff that's coming out related to the Internet of Things. And I'm sure we're going to see more and more of these things as we move forward. You know, do be a little bit cautious 
think about who these different companies are that are creating these devices and whether or not you trust them to have good security um, and whether or not you think that they're concerned about your privacy. All right, that's it for today. I'll talk to you all soon.